Hi, everyone. Welcome back. So this week, we're going to move on and we're going to finish up the court system. So we're going to move on and talk about chapter nine, which is sentencing. We're going to break sentencing into two parts. First, we're going to talk about sentencing and punishment, like an overview of the different parts of it. And then the second part will specifically focus on the death penalty. And we'll talk about some of those provisions. So we're going to start first by talking about sentencing and punishment. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint with you, and we're going to go through some of the basics of sentencing and punishment. Um, so this is the first part of that lecture. So the first thing I want you to do is just, I want you to stop the video, and I want you to look at this list, and I want you to rank them from most serious being number one, down to what you would identify as the least serious. So you can stop the video and then try to rank them and then restart the video. Okay, so I hope everybody's back. Now, the purpose of this wasn't because there's a right or wrong answer. The purpose is I want you to really think about the seriousness of crimes. So when we're talking about punishments, one of the things that's really important to understand is punishments are based on how serious we rank certain crimes. So all the crimes in the penal law have to be ranked. And obviously the most serious crimes need the most serious punishments. And then as you go down to the least punishment. So they have to be proportionate to the crime that's committed. So that's an important factor. So when you rank to your crimes, the one at the top, you would give the most serious punishments. And then as you go down, you would give them less serious punishments. Okay, so always remember when we're talking about punishments, the seriousness of the crime is ultimately usually going to lead to what the punishment's going to be. So let's just take a quick look at how punishments have evolved throughout history. So we have a little sense of how they have changed throughout time. So many of the earliest forms of punishment were really, really harsh forms of punishment. So think about some of the movies that you've watched, like Braveheart, or I don't know, I'm not gonna be able to think of someone, but different movies that you watched about historic early forms of punishment. And what kind of punishments do you think that they included? Well, if you think back, most of them probably were extremely harsh forms of punishment. They were probably very cruel and torturous. They probably could have involved some fines, but mostly it would involve some physical punishment or even death. The basis for early forms of punishment was this concept called lex talionis. And this was the idea of the law of retaliation. And so it was all based on what we would call an eye for an eye. So you commit a serious crime, we're going to torture you and physically punish you as retaliation for that crime that you committed. So drawing and quartering, hanging, cutting off limbs, uh, tarring and feathering, uh, putting them in stocks and throwing stuff or um, at gallows and throwing things at them. So these were what we considered torturous or cruel sort of punishments. But that it was the early forms of punishment. We've really changed our ideas about punishment in more modern times. And we rank or dis define punishment in a different way. So basically, the traditional forms of punishment would be fines, where you have to pay money, imprisonment, which would be putting somebody in jail. Sometimes you have probation, so you would go to jail, but we're going to suspend that sentence and let you stay out. And if you don't do anything wrong, you can stay out under supervision. Otherwise, you have to go back to jail, which is imprisonment. And then another traditional form would be death. So we want to think about how would a judge make a decision about which punishment would be appropriate based on the crime? So what was the drug judge trying to accomplish with each of these punishments. So basically what the judge is doing is evaluating the different goals of punishment. So when you look at punishment, there are five main goals to punishment, retribution, deterrence, incapacitation, rehabilitation, and restoration. 
So retribution is going to be that lex talionis. It's the eye for an eye. So retribution is you're seeking revenge for the fact that the person committed a crime. Okay. Deterrence. Deterrence is trying to stop future crimes, deter them, keep them from happening. Now you can have two forms of deterrence. General deterrence is when you want to give a punishment that all of society can see. And then they say, wow, look what happened to him. I don't want to do that. You also can have specific deterrence, which is going to keep the actual person that committed the crime from wanting to continue to commit crimes. But remember, deterrence is trying to keep others from committing a crime. Incapacitation is somehow keeping them away from others or hindering their ability to commit more crimes, incapacitating them. They used to sometimes cut off hands. If you don't have a hand, you can't steal. A lot of times now incapacitation is just locking people up and keeping them away. Uh, Rehabilitation is trying to make them better, to fix them and return them to society as more productive members of society. And then restoration is returning the victim to the position they were prior to the offense being committed, okay? So if you steal $20 from the victim, restoration is giving $20 back. That's the idea of restoration. So we have these goals and we have to understand what they are. So I have a little scenario. You name the goal. So Joel is sentenced um, to imprison for killing someone. What would be the goals associated with that? Oh, I thought I had the answer. Sorry. So sentence to prison, incapacitation, right? Maybe deterrence. So Sally, Sandy is caught driving her car without a license and required to pay a fine. So the form of sentence is fine. Maybe deterrence because you don't want to lose your money, right? So that could be deterrence. Jenny is sent to boot camp for two weeks. Could be incapacitation because you're locked up for two weeks could be rehabilitation. Burns steals $400 from his neighbor and is required to pay the money back. Restoration. Gerda has to attend alcohol rehab facility for two months. Rehabilitation, incapacitation for the time. Greg is sent to jail for life because he committed three federal felonies. So it could be deterrence, definitely incapacitation, possibly even retaliation, eye for an eye. And then Rick committed murder and is on death row. Definitely retaliation. You kill somebody, we're going to kill you. Definitely incapacitation, we're locking you up. Possibly deterrence. If you kill somebody, you're going to get killed. It could deter other people from committing a crime. Okay. Oh, I gave you the answers here. So here you go. Okay. Sorry. Should have went slower for you. Okay. So now I want you to think of this scenario. A college senior was caught illegally downloading copyright songs onto his iPhone without permission using the university computer. The value of the songs is $150. So you have to think about what would be your punishment. So when you rank it in order of the most serious crimes versus least serious, are you going to lean more towards a higher sentence or lower sentence based on where it fits in with other crimes? So what would your sentence be? Why did you give that punishment? So when you're deciding why you would give that punishment, you want to think about what goals are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to have him pay back what he's lost, what he stole? Are you trying to, um, sorry, my phone ringing. Are you trying to uh, punish them, retaliation? Are you trying to deter it from happening in the future? So you have to think about what goal you're actually trying to achieve. And then that's what you use then to help you determine what your punishment should be. So once we've thought about the concept of punishment, we have to think about sentencing. 
So what is the actual process of sentencing? So sentencing is imposing criminal sanctions by a judicial authority. So sentencing is when you want to actually give that punishment to the person during a sort of judicial procedure. So we had the trial, the person's convicted. Now we have to have a special judicial proceeding to hand down a sentence for that person. That is sentencing. Okay. Now, when you're thinking about the proper sentence to give as a judge, you want to consider three different things. You need a balanced sentence. So proportionality is what we talked about. You want it to be in the line of the similar offenses. So the crime is proportionate to, the punishment is proportionate to the crime that was committed. So you don't want super harsh or too easy. You want it to be proportionate. You want equity. So you want equality. Similar people that committed similar offenses are also going to receive similar punishments. So you want them to be equitable among other people. And then social debt, you want the person to have to pay back to society for disturbing the social order when they committed the crime. So they have to pay that social debt. So when you're sentencing, you want to balance these three things. As a judge, you need to consider all three of these things when determining a possible sentence. When you balance all three of these things, that's what's called a structured sentence, that you've taken into consideration all three of these things to properly determine the sentence. Now, I want to get into some of the logistics of sentencing so you know some of the terminology. When the judge sentences a person and they sentence them to imprisonment, so let's say I'm going to actually send you to jail. There are two types of sentences that can be given. One is called an indeterminate sentence. An indeterminate sentence is a sentence that has a maximum and a minimum, but no exact time. So if you're sentenced to an indeterminate sentence, you may get three to five years. You do not know exactly when you're going to get out. You could serve three years, three and a half years, four years, four and a half years. You may serve all the way to five. So it's indeterminate. The judge is not setting your actual release day. The day you actually get out is probably going to be determined by a parole board. Now, you could have another choice, which is what we call a determinate sentence. A determinate sentence is when the judge does give you a specific period of time you will spend three months in jail. So judges either can give a determinate or indeterminate sentence. Now in New York, we usually give determinate sentences for misdemeanors and indeterminate sentences for felonies. Okay, now there's a couple other issues or concepts that you have to understand with sentencing. So gain time, so you get your sentence, you get five years in jail you have gain time. This is the time deducted from the prison time for participation in special programming. So when you go to become incarcerated and you go to jail, if you do an anger management program or drug counseling, you may get time deducted from your sentence. You've gained time, good time. I'm sorry, you gained time so that they're going to deduct it so your sentence would be less. Then good time, same concept, they're going to deduct from your sentence because of good behavior. So it's an incentive to behave while you're in prison. So both of these could ultimately then reduce the amount of actual time that you spend. So even though the judge gave you five years, if you have gain time and good time credited to you, maybe you spend four years, maybe you spend three and a half years. And that's the concept of good and gain time. Now, one of the problems with that is that inmates end up spending less than their sentence in jail. And people get upset with that sometimes. And they say, if I'm the victim, you said five years and now they're getting out in three. That wasn't true. So there's been a lot of arguments against uh, doing that because they say you should have truth in sentencing. You really should 
be clear of what the person's spending in jail and they should have to actually serve that time. We also know there's sentencing discrepancies based on race, that a lot of times white inmates get out after serving much smaller percentages of time than black inmates. So all of this leads to people mistrusting the system because they think, well, it's not really truthful. You're really not going to make the person stay in jail as long as you said they were. And so sometimes there's a pushback against indeterminate sentencing or gain time or good time. And they say, no, you should have to serve exactly what your sentence is. Now, sometimes in order to combat that truth and sentencing arguments, some states and some legislatures and the federal government have created what's called mandatory sentencing. So mandatory sentencing is the idea that if you are charged with a certain crime, you are required to um, spend that amount of time in jail. They are required, the judge is required to give you that sentence. So certain bad crimes, you could get a mandatory death, life in prison without parole or death sentence. Okay, can't get death. I'm sorry. We'll talk about that later. But there could be a mandatory life in prison without parole. So what happens is Congress or the state legislature think that there's certain crimes. And if you commit those certain crimes, you get this sentence. So mandatory sentencing takes away the judge's discretion in actually giving a sentence. So what they created was called the Federal Sentencing Guidelines. And what they did is they took all the crimes and ranked them just like we did on the first slide from most serious to least serious. And then we took the defendants and ranked them. Is it your first crime? Is it a second crime? Is it a violent crime? And we rank them from one to 10 based on how serious the crime and how serious the offender. And then you draw a line from the number on the offender and the number of crime and it gave you a box and that's what told the judge what the sentence should be. And it was mandatory and we required judges to follow this in the federal system. A lot of states also passed and the federal government passed what we call three strikes laws. Three strikes laws are the idea that if you commit three felonies, the third felony, you automatically get life in prison without parole. Now, the federal government has changed that to three violent felonies. Um, but other states have chosen not to do that. And so this showed you California. You could have three felonies, but none of them could be that serious. There was a case where a boy, his third felony was stealing a piece of pizza. But since it was his third crime, it turned into a felony, third felony. Then he ultimately got life in prison for stealing a piece of pizza. But three strikes laws are a form of mandatory sentencing. Hopefully you can see that they can be super harsh. So there's been a lot of criticism of this kind of sentencing. It doesn't allow the judges any discretion to take factors into consideration and really give a proportionate sentence based on the actual crime. Now, another thing you have to understand is what if you are being sentenced to multiple crimes at the same time? So you break into a house, so that's burglary, and then you sexually assault the person in there when you're in there. So those are two separate crimes. They each get their own sentence. How you serve those sentences can either be consecutive or concurrent. So let's say you get 10 years for the burglary, 15 years for the rape. If it's consecutive, you serve one first and then serve the second. If it's concurrent, you serve them both at the same time. So it's really important when the judge gives multiple sentences, the judge is going to have to specify, are they going to be served concurrently or consecutively? Okay. So let me go back. I thought I had an example here. So my example. So if you did burglary and sexual assault, burglary, 10 years, sexual assault, 15 if you're serving consecutive sentences, you ultimately spend 25 years in jail. But if they serve concurrently, the most you'll spend is 15. So it's really, really um, can make a huge difference if you are sentenced consecutively or concurrently. 
Okay. Now, another concept, and this is going to become very, very important when we talk about the death penalty in the next lecture. When you are sentencing, especially when we're talking about the death penalty, the jury has to consider what we call aggravating circumstances and mitigating circumstances. So aggravating circumstances are literally what they're saying. They're aggravating. They aggravate the judge. They make the jury want to give a harsher punishment. They're aggravating. They make you mad at the defendant. Mitigating are things that make you feel sympathetic to the defendant and maybe want to give a lower sentence. So aggravating could be you kill a young person, a child. You have multiple people killed. Uh, you do the killing in a very torturous way. So those things are aggravating and you want to give a harsher sentence. Mitigating, maybe they got hooked on drugs when they were young and abused by their parents when they were young. Maybe they um, have an dis intellectual disability when they don't really understand what's going on. So those would be what we consider mitigating circumstances. So another thing judge has to consider are these things. They have to balance aggravating and mitigating circumstances. This is going to be a requirement when the jury possibly gives the death penalty. They have to actually make a list and vote on all the factors they consider aggravating. They have to make a list and list all the things they consider mitigating. And when they're deciding death penalty, the aggravating has to outweigh the mitigating. Otherwise, they cannot give the death penalty. So these factors become really, really important when you're talking about sentencing. So here's a list of all the different aggravating and mitigating circumstances that are often considered. It's not exclusive, but it tells you some examples. So um, I posted, I think I posted, I will post a sample sentencing chart. So you can look at the sentencing chart and you can see my questions and you can use the sentencing guidelines like I just talked about. So you can see the chart and you can read the questions and you can figure out what the sentencing should be. So you can see how it is done. Okay, so this is the chart that you'll use. So remember, these are the ranking of the crimes along the left. So you rank the crimes based on how serious they are. And then across the top, you would rank how serious the offender is. You think that they're a really serious offender. So if I have murder and a really serious offender, obviously it's gonna be life, okay? So you can see based on months. Now this just tells you what other sentencing options are available, the keys down at the bottom. So spend some time looking at that, reading the questions, seeing if you can kind of figure out what the judge would sentence based on the chart. Okay, so here's another little scenario that you can read and think about. These are just to think about. There's not really right or wrong answers. It's just thought provoking some different things that are important to sentencing. Okay, so let's just talk real quick now before we're done about the different steps that will exist in the sentencing process. So we've already gone through the steps in the trial. One of the last steps is that the verdict jury will determine if the person's guilty or not guilty. If they're guilty, they convict them. If they're not guilty, they acquit them. So let's just assume you have a guilty verdict because if it's not guilty, you go home and it's all over. So if the person's found guilty and convicted, then you move into what we call the sentencing phase. So what will happen is the judge will, will set a date for the sentencing hearing. So sometimes on TV, they say you're guilty and they immediately give them the sentence. That only happens if the sentence is mandatory. So if it's a crime in a state that says if you commit that crime, you automatically get life without parole, then you can give the verdict and the sentence all on the same day. Most times that doesn't occur though. Most times they set a date for an actual sentencing hearing. And there's different things that are going to happen during that sentencing hearing. You're gonna have a pre-sentence investigation first, and then you're gonna have a pre-sentence investigation report that's gonna be given to the judge. 
You're going to possibly have victim impact statements, and you're going to have what's called the defendant allocution. Once those steps are all done, then the judge would actually pronounce the ultimate sentence that this person's going to receive. So let's talk about what each of those things are. So the first one is what we call the pre-sentence investigation. So what happens when a person is convicted is their case is sent to probation in New York probation. And what they're going to do is a little mini investigation into this defendant. They want to know everything about this person. Are they in school? Do they have a job? Who's their family? Are they religious? Were they in the military? What kind of crime? Tell me about the victims. So the probation department is going to find out everything they can specifically about this crime. And looking at all of that, they're going to make a recommendation to the judge of what they think the sentence should be based on this report. Okay, so this would be what a sample pre-sentence investigation report would look like. So you would identify the crime. You would give personal information about the person. You would look up their prior criminal history, their educational background, health issues, current health conditions, military service, religion, financial condition. Once you gather all that information, then you ultimately make your own recommendation. So read through this and think, what would your recommendation be on this type of crime? probation, incarceration, how long would the incarceration, counseling, what would you require the punishment? What would you recommend to the judge? The judge would be the one that requires it. What would be your recommendation to the judge? Okay. Now, another thing that could happen is, oh, and that's then, this is your pre-sentence report. So PSI is pre-sentence investigation. When you type all this up and write it up and you hand it to the judge, you hand it in a report form. Sometimes the judge just reads the report and takes it into consideration. Sometimes there's a little hearing where the probation officer has to take the stand and the judge can ask questions. All of that will occur during the sentencing hearing. Now, another thing that could occur is what we call victim impact statements. This is when we allow the victim to stand up and make a statement during the sentencing. So the victim can stand up and explain to the defendant and to the court what impact this crime has had on their life. Usually they're very emotional, very propelling. I have a link here. If you go to the PowerPoint and click on it, it shows you um, this one girl was kidnapped and held hostage for a very long time. And it can show you the impact that these victim instead victim impact statements can have on the judge and potentially the jury when making a determination of what the sentence should be. And then the last one is what we call a defendant allocution. This is when the defendant can make a formal statement to the court. So most likely prior to this, the defendant probably didn't testify. A lot of times they choose not to testify. And the defendant's just quiet a lot of times during the trial. Since they're already convicted, there's not a lot of self-incrimination going on. So then defense, they're already convicted and found guilty. So then the defendant can say stuff if they want. They can stand up. Sometimes they stand up and say, I didn't do it. You're sending me away and I didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes they stand up and apologize. It's just the ability of the defendant to say something during sentencing in their defense if they want to. So again, I have a link if you want to watch an allocution. Okay, so we're not going to do this because you're online. And then the last thing is just a little fill in the blank to see if you understood. So try to fill in the blanks and then um, stop the video. And when you're ready, I'll flip the, the slide. Hopefully you're back. And there are your answers. Hopefully you got them all right. And that is the end of sentencing and punishment. So the last PowerPoint then will be talking about the death penalty specifically as a form of punishment. So um, hopefully you enjoyed that. And I will quickly be posting the second one that you can continue on with the lecture for this week. Have a nice night.